Look, the Thar Desert, as it's normally uh, thought of, is the area of Rajasthan that extends west of the Arabi Hills. Now, obviously, it crosses over into Pakistan as well, so parts of Punjab mm -hmm. are also part of the Thar Desert. And as far as Kutch and Sindh are concerned, further south, it's also thought of, thought of as being part of the Thar Desert. So that area is the Thar, which is also really part of a much larger area of deserts that extends westwards all the way to North Africa and the Sahara. So it's really a part of a huge belt of deserts. But the Thar, the word Thar is as, it's, uh, mm -hmm. as it's used, or the word Thar as I've learned uh, mm -hmm. to be in its origin, uh, is this part of the desert west of the Arab region. And in India, the extent is, uh, which are the districts that it covers? So, um, in, in Rajasthan, we're talking of Bikane, uh, Jaisalmer, and Barmer as the three districts that are. So, for, for a plant growing in the desert, there are certain obvious uh, you know, limitations. One, of course, is the lack of water. So, a plant needs to adapt to the fact that there is very little rainfall which may be as much as 25 centimeters a year in a place like Jodhpur, mm. but it falls down to between 0 and 4 centimeters in a place like Jaisalmer. So water is obviously the great, the big limiting factor. But other than water, you also have other factors such as the rockiness, the parts of the desert, something like 30% of the Thar Desert is actually rocky and not sandy. And even if it seems sandy on the surface, it's actually underlain by rock. When we, when we started out trying to create Rajoda Park, I knew very little about the desert. The first thing we learned was that there's a huge difference between plants that grow in rock and plants that grow in sand. They, the, conditions are, the, the conditions are quite different. For a, for a plant growing in rock, um, obviously the roots can't find their way very deep into the rock, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas for a plant growing in sand, the sand yields so the root can find its way quite far down. We've actually picked up a buoy plant which is about 7 inches or 8 inches tall and taken it out of the ground and found that it has a root that's taller than a man. So what a plant growing in the sand does is that it invests all its energy in pushing its root down and finding moisture before the overground bits start to grow. So there's huge difference. In, in, the, in a rocky um, substrate, what plants tend to do more is they either suck in, like the thor is, or they're short-lived, like the ephemerals are. Um, and that's the most common way to actually survive in, in rocky conditions. Rock, you know, obviously is a limiting factor as well for certain kinds of plants. But then there is heat, uh, the immense heat of the desert. And there's also the, the you know, the, the wash of light that you get at the height of the day, you know, that also can be a limiting factor for some plants. So plants have different ways of dealing with these. One of the most interesting uh, ways of dealing with it is that there are plants that actually, um, you know, they, they, their photosynthetic reactions take place at night. So they're not actually active in the day at all. The flowers stay closed, for example. Okay. And the leaves, uh, actually also they manage to close the pores through which, through which transpiration takes place. And all the, the real business of living takes place at night. But succulence is another way that plants will deal with these limiting factors, that they will store moisture in their leaves or in their tissues or in their roots perhaps, you know, succulents. But then perhaps the most common way of dealing with the limiting factors of the desert Mm. Is, is to live only for a very short time in that little window when there is moisture in the ground. So plants, lots and lots of plants, especially ephemeral, they call ephemerals because they live for a short time. They will germinate with the first rains very quickly and they'll rush through their life cycle, through their flowering and their fruiting, and they'll drop hard-coated seeds in the ground, mm. which will then, then the plant will die. And those hard, you know, hard, Hard-coated seeds will remain till the next year, but they'll be dormant as plants. Mm. And they'll only come to life again when the rains come, you know, eight months or nine months later. That is a very, very common characteristic of desert plants, not just here. There are lots of little, wonderful plants that come out in the, in the rainy season.
you know, I mean, I always say that when people want to visit Rajodha Park, I say, try and come at the end of August or early September, because that's when you get all the ephemerals coming out. And because ephemerals don't have to survive very harsh conditions, they're using that one narrow window, you know, when there's moisture in the soil, you get this wonderful play of, you know, of plants being able to actually do all kinds of things with their flowers, you know. So um, we have, I mean, we've counted something like 230, 240 species of plants in, in our rocky part of the park. Uh, you get another 150-odd in sandy parts and deserts. You have about 400, 500 species of plants in the desert um, from something like 60 different flowering plant families. There's a magnificent tree called the Indrok, which I completely fell in love with. The Indrok is a tree that forms clonal clumps. They, they grow, it grows in a particular calcium-rich soil. Uh, in, the, in the degree of calcium, that would be actually be toxic for most plants. Hugely, hugely calcium-rich. Very few plants can actually survive in that soil. And they grow in seasonal streams that lead into a lake. You know, they're called nadis in, the, in the Marwar. And the first time we saw this collection of trees, they were the only living things there. You know, there were about 250 trees, magnificent trees with little leaves of beautiful things. And we, I realized later that all of these trees were actually linked underground. So what the Indrok tree does is that because it's very difficult for its seed to have any chance of germinating in that kind of soil, what it does is it sends an underground uh, it's called a runner. It's not technically a root. It sends a runner underground from which a new tree emerges. And another, and another. And in time, you'll get an entire forest of Indrok trees that are actually one single organism with the identical DNA. So when somebody says, what's the largest organism on Earth? It's not a whale. It's not a sequoia tree. It's one of these clonal forests, which are, you know, actually have, can theoretically have thousands of trees, but which are all one individual, one species, one individual species. So we started the park in 2006. Um, I was invited in 2005 to take a look at this, this wasteland that lies around um, Merangar Fort. And I was asked if I wanted to green it. You know, that was the expression that was used. And, it didn't take me long to realize that what they meant by greening it probably meant, you know, lawns and, you know, that conventional civic <laughs> park with flowering trees and gulmars. And obviously this is such a difficult terrain. It's, it's, for one, it's intensely rocky. This is all volcanic rock, highly eroded, with deep gullies. And with Jodhpur's rainfall, this is, you know, this is, these are desert plants. And I said, look, um, if we try and do a conventional civic park here. It's going, to, it's going to need millions, literally millions of tons of soil, and you're going to have to look after every single plant for the rest of your life. Um, it's not viable, it's not practical, it's not sustainable, right? So I said, why don't we try and restore the natural ecology of this place and look for plants that are adapted to growing in the park? The, the huge factor that we have to get rid of an invasive tree from Mexico and Southern America that had taken over this entire area. Because in the 1930s, one of the Maharajas, Umed Singh, had, be, had been told by somebody that, look, if you want to green your desert kingdom, there's this magical tree that doesn't seem to need water, doesn't seem to need nutrients in the soil. All you need to do is scatter the seeds. So he ordered bagfuls of Prosopis juliflora seeds from Mexico. And he was an aeroplane enthusiast himself. I like to think of him in sort of leather flying gear with a little tiger moth going up into the air and scattering, literally broadcasting all this seed throughout the kingdom of Jodhpur, which you have to remember was a lot, lot, was a lot larger than the district of Jodhpur is today. So Maharaj Amit Singh went up in the air and broadcast all these seeds. And wherever it find, found the right conditions, Prosopis juliflora, which came to be known as Bavlia in Rajasthan, which means the mad one. Mad because it grows madly, it outcompetes everything else madly. Bavlia literally just outcompeted everything else. So when I first went to this part of the, the wasteland that became the park, 
uh, I would say that 99% of all the trees growing there were all bagnia. There was nothing else. Because what bagnia does is it secretes an alkaloid in its root zone that inhibits anything else from growing there. And uh, once it takes root, it's, you know, it's unstoppable. So the big problem for us really was how to get rid of bagnia. And that's a, it's a long story. But essentially, we did it manually um, with uh, traditional miners from Marwar who had a special way of understanding the rock and how the rock was interbedded and how to go in. And they literally went tree by tree by tree over seven years, plot by plot, until they eradicated the Bagnia completely. And very often we'd see wonderful looking plants growing in very distinctive kinds of soils. And on a few occasions we would actually collect their seeds and we'd say, we, we'd hope that maybe we would find a way of surviving in rock, and it, they never did. And then we suddenly thought of the idea of creating little microhabitats, raised beds essentially, where we would bring in that particular soil and then grow those plants. We've done that. Uh, we've created 12 microhabitats in the desert. Um, it's sorry, in the, we've created 12 microhabitats in the park. Um, one of them, for example, comes from a very salty habitat with, you know, with very high degrees of sodium in it that, again, is very toxic to most plants. But there are two succulents and two kinds of grasses that grow very happily in this kind of soil. And that's, that's done amazingly well. We've got uh, a microhabitat of, um, of uh, fuller's earth, which is a kind of clay that you get. Um, again, very difficult for some plants to grow in but it has its own distinctive kind of flora. We've got glass sand, which is a kind of large, large crystals of silica, um, which also has its own distinctive flora. So we've got now 12 different kinds of flora in miniature in the park. And that's, that's allowed us to actually showcase a lot of flowers and a lot of plants that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to bring back to the plant. To the See, the conservation, the, you know, the, the degree of protection that plants get in the thar is problematic because on the one hand you have orans, you have, you have sacred groves, um, which don't really look like sacred groves in the traditional sense, but they tend to be vast areas that are regarded locally by people as being uh, worthy of protection. The, the most common um, kind of oran that you see in the thar actually consists of bale trees. And it's not the, it's not the big bale, but the little bale, the Zizifus area that is actually mm -hmm. conserved. Um, but there, you know, it's a, it's a rough and ready kind of conservation. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no official protection. The desert national park sprawls over a large area, and there is some protection there, I guess. But there isn't any real awareness of what is special about the plants that grow in the desert. Um, me and some friends of mine, um, when we were traveling in the desert exploring, we came across a particular kind of shrubland, um, which we thought was very, very beautiful, very, very distinctive and interesting. And we would often ask people in the desert, is there a name? Do you know? Uh, uh, do you have a name for this kind of vegetation? We, we would call it SBK because the three most distinctive plants here were the senior, the bui, and the keep, which are local names for three plants that were very common there. But it was very, very beautiful and very small. There were only very small areas that actually where you found this kind of vegetation. And we kept asking people, and they would say, Nisa, I was kohamu, sa but they'd give, a, they'd give us a place name. And we were looking for a generic name for the type of jungle, the type of forest, not the forest really, but the shrubland. And finally we met a man who said, Haan, I'm from Roy. And we said, really, Roy? And he said, huh? And we said, what do you call areas where you don't get these plants? He said, I'm from And we realized that the word thar actually is the origin of the word thar, which is an anglicized word that has you know, mistakenly been transcribed from, from the word thar. And then we also discovered that James Todd in 1829, traveling out of Sindh into Jaisalmer, says the jungle of the desert is called the Roi, and he describes the shrubland. So we have the remnants of a very, very beautiful, distinctive kind of vegetation that is now severely endangered in the Thar. 
And unfortunately, even the forest department doesn't recognize it or know it or take any special means, uh, any special measures to try and protect it. In fact, in some of the areas inside the um, Desert National Park, the DNP, where they're trying to protect the, the bustard, instead of actually growing or trying to you know, encourage more roe to happen, they clear roe to grow salmon grass under the mistaken impression that this is what the bustard needs. But in fact, the most important, from a conservation point of view and from an ecological point of view, the most important areas in the desert are actually roe. And we hope to actually now try and create more awareness of the roe.